I V M. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IBM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IBM swag. So do fill out those surveys. The startup ecosystem as a whole has helped solve many a problem and challenge while driving immense innovation in every space. They've also been boosted by programs that have helped accelerate their process of innovation. One such accelerator that has enabled startups, not just with advanced technology, but also with broad-based mentorship and support, has been the Google for Startups Accelerator. And today, we have its head, Paul Rabindranath, on Advertising is Dead, to not just talk about the startup ecosystem and how Google is enabling innovation through this program, but also how they've had to evolve as an accelerator to connect with the needs of startups today. I'm Varun Dugarala. This advertising is dead. we right back with Paul. A hundred bucks. That's all it takes to begin your journey with Bitcoin and Ethereum. No, really. With CoinSwitch, you can start investing in over a hundred cryptocurrencies with just hundred rupees. On top of that, there are zero charges for deposits and withdrawals, so you can trade, buy, sell, however and whenever you want. All of this, plus their extremely intuitive interface, makes CoinSwitch the perfect app for beginners in the crypto space. But don't take my word for it. Just download CoinSwitch for free and try it out for yourself. If you'd like more information on cryptocurrencies, tune into a show about crypto with me, Rohan Joshi, my new adventure on IBM Podcasts. CoinSwitch. Kuch to badlega. Welcome back to Advertising is Dead. Uh, we're talking to Paul. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Varun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I thought it'd be a good place to kind of start off by talking about the Google for Startups Accelerator and just kind of explaining how it works, how it's different from the traditional accelerator model. Uh, I thought it'd be a good place to kind of start to kind of set the landscape and then we can go into individual points. Sure, Varun. Um, so the Google for Startup Accelerator is actually born out of uh, an effort at Google that concerns developers and engagement with the tech and the developer communities. And this effort has been on for more than 10 years. It's purely an ecosystem building activity uh, because companies like Google exist because of the developer ecosystem building on top of uh, all of the great platforms. So we've been working with developer communities very closely for long. Uh, about five, six years ago, uh, we saw a need in the ecosystem where startups were up and coming, they're trying out various new technologies. Uh, as a company, we had expertise in this. We wanted to give back to the community. We want to give back to the ecosystem. Um, and there were immense opportunities in countries like India and across the world. Right. So that's how Accelerator actually began as a one-week mentoring model. Mm. We called it Launchpad Week. And it evolved mm. and snowballed into like a full-blown Accelerator, uh, which is today a three-month program, runs twice a year in India. Uh, but not only in India, we have actually 17 Accelerators all over the world. And that's how mm. it's grown uh, you know, starting from India, Israel, and then this kind of blossoming out all over the world. That's a little quick uh, background on, on the accelerator itself. Uh, I can talk a little bit about the model, right? How yeah, it is, yeah. um, say, different. Um, so our accelerator, the backbone of everything we do is based on mentoring, right? So mm. uh, we have really world-class uh, mentors, not just Google employees or Google teams, right? So there are like more than 20, 30 Google teams involved here uh, in, in, in supporting the startups. But we also go out and collect really great mentors from the ecosystem, from the industry, from the investor community, from expertise across different areas. Uh, and we have them volunteering their time to give back to the ecosystem again. The attitude and intent here is a founder first, kind of a, creating a psychologically safe environment for a founder community to learn and grow from inputs, not just from Google and all of the stuff we have to offer, but also from our free and open mentor community. So three month program, we, we kind of, get a lot of startups, we, we get a lot of startups applying to the program. We have a process by which uh, we kind of make, bring that down to about 20 companies in a cohort. Uh, and then we have a three-month structured program where we offer mentorships across really important key things that we've identified to be the needs uh, over the years. They tend to be things like product strategy, UX and UI, engineering and tech stack choices, uh, founding team and founder focus people issues and how do we resolve that? That's another module in, in Google. So it's really a 360 degree program. Uh, and, a, and an ecosystem like India is kind of buzzing with so many different solutions coming up. And uh, as Google, we want to create something that directly adds value to founders and helps the ecosystem grow as we build and grow and nurture companies that are building and building amazing things. 
we also lean into like cutting edge startups that are using cutting edge tech like ai machine learning we have a very strong muscle in those areas as google and we're able to really lean into the opportunities that this new technology platform uh, and approaches offer to startups by helping them to kind of really understand on how to build using ml ai for scale and sustainability that kind of addresses the needs of emerging ecosystems like india uh, you know next billion markets and so on so that's that's where a startup accelerator comes from and how our model is right now yeah what's interesting about um, this entire model right is that obviously we're seeing this I would even call it acceleration. It's almost like this, it's a sea of startups, right? Um, if you go like, I would say about five, six years ago, there weren't as many who getting built out as many opportunities. And, and as this entire piece is kind of scaled up, um, everyone's looking for how they can kind of build on top of platforms, how they can kind of leverage everything that the internet, everything that technology kind of allows them to do. And so I find this model very interesting, especially if from a startup perspective saying, okay, hey, I can learn how from the platforms itself, how, how to kind of build this out, leverage any form of expertise, etc. And if you add the layer of the last two years of just like how, uh, I know we've all been remote and everything's been kind of, I don't overuse the word disruption, but everything's been disrupted beyond a certain uh, level. How is the last two years kind of affected how you functioned with startups? Yeah, I mean, I think if I go back to 2020, that was, that was, you always have these kind of black swan moments or once in a blue moon kind of stuff that happen. Uh, I think the first six to eight months of 2020 uh, when the pandemic began was like super uncertain and, and we didn't really know where things were headed, right? So uh, even at that point, as Google for startups, we did put out kind of a playbook on how can you kind of tide over this kind of crisis situation. And uh, that again was a playbook that was uh, a coming together of ideas from investors, from startups out there who were dealing with a live situation and uh, our mentor network and what they thought. So it was kind of a wisdom of crowds kind of an effort. And if I were to kind of let just tip a little bit into that, what are the best practices of how the startups, quote unquote, tried to tide over 2020 or the early part? It was more about a kind of resetting where you were, reassessing as, you know, as a company or a pro uh, or a startup where you are headed. And that often meant taking hard choices both in terms of uh, cutting your turn rate, uh, making sure that you are identifying, say, new sources of revenue as a startup, um, looking at things like, how do you raise money in an environment like this? What's the appetite even to get money? Um, and really, like, survive, right? So, so I mean, you might want to cut off the limb to save the body, so to speak. It's a startup. All of the startups were kind of in that, that mode about how do we sustain the business. Many others were actually looking at it as, look, this is, there's tailwinds for for new sectors, right? So uh, how do we lean into that opportunity? And the interplay of existing businesses and emerging businesses also leads to a lot of these pivots. You're pivoting your business from A to B to lean into the new opportunity. So I think that was product strategy and evolving the strategy of the product. I think those were all very hot conversations that 2020 or early part of 2020 has had. But what's happened post that, like, I mean, it feels like peacetime now, uh, but I know this year again, you know, we had like a pretty hard wave too. Um, and that did affect uh, things like productivity because startups and most businesses uh, you know, in the IT world had figured out a way to work from home. Uh, well-being and other things were beginning to perhaps get a little better for employees. But that again, uh, with Wave 2, I, I believe was a little worse. Right? So mm. many, many startups are still recovering from that as a workforce. But by and large, I think a lot of them have began to lean into the opportunities, the new economic opportunities that are available. A lot of pivots have been done and dusted. Many startups have shut down uh, because that's, that was the right thing to do. So I think as an ecosystem, I think perhaps we are moving towards a little bit of a, you know, a better state than how things were in 2020. So that whole evolution and how the ecosystem managed, uh, you know, I think I'm quite proud of uh, what I've seen entrepreneurs do um, and uh, also the ecosystem itself has risen up to kind of yeah. contribute in many, many different ways. So yeah. so yeah, it's been a really interesting year and a half through this transition. And I think another element of that is especially during this period, like you said, it's been good to see how people have not just adapted, but have also kind of played their part in building out stuff that will help other human beings, right? So uh, while all products are built towards consumers in different ways, you have to talk physical, digital, all that stuff, but there's this been growing focus on 
on building startups that focus on just like other human beings, right? Like how can we play a larger role in that? How can we have larger social impact, et cetera? Um, from looking at this entire, uh, you know, your, your journey with the accelerator, have you seen that that's growing in prominence now compared to, let's say, early days? Has that become a core focus of just how that's becoming a stronger part of the entire startup story? Yeah. I mean, um, I would say if I kind of take all the emotion out of, uh, you know, what's what's been happening around us, there is a lot of data on offer right now. Uh, lots and lots of, because with the whole digital first move, um, everything is now done online. And there is, therefore, there is so much more new lines of businesses that have opened up and also and so much more access to uh, understanding new users that have come on board, right? And that naturally has created a lots lots of new business ideas and new lines of uh, thinking. Uh, but if you look at the kinds of businesses that are flourishing, definitely ed tech, right? That's a huge one. Mm-hmm. Healthcare, we're seeing with uh, the whole telemedicine move towards telemedicine uh, that's been happening. Uh, and funnily enough, media and entertainment and gaming, you know, mm-hmm. people spending more time with devices. I don't know, yeah. it's a good thing for digital well-being, but it is, <laughs> it is on the rise, right? It's it's, yeah. it's getting up there. Um, but the other emerging one that kind of has gained a lot more significance is definitely well-being and mental health. Right? So, And we've seen, mm. even in our applicant profile, uh, lots of companies that are trying to work in this particular space. You know, it's about better health in general, mm. uh, but particularly mental health and that becoming more of a normal conversation. And uh, you see apps that we've supported to accelerator like Wiser, uh, which is a mental health AI chatbot mm. app with multiple other solutions. Or last year, a uh, startup we supported called the Inner Hour, uh, which essentially uh, helps with the mm. same uh, mental health space. And they were kind of judged as one of the best apps for good in the ecosystem. The emergence of these kinds of apps, and not only emergence, but the usage and traction for some of these mental health companies, um, it's is really strong. And uh, it kind of is reflective of uh, what's happening around us as well. well. That's an interesting point, right? Because um, if, you, if you look at this whole pattern of saying, you know, initially it was a lot more about um, the experience, but I think we're also moving towards how can how can products kind of help enrich how we function as human beings. I think being enclosed in our houses has in some ways made us more open to what we what we might actually require uh, to be able to scale. I think that's really where a lot of these products are really being able to scale up as well. Uh, on on the other pieces as well, I mean, what have you seen that startups have really asked you for? Um, so obviously when you started off, they would be, okay, this is a set of requirements that we believe that startups will have. But as it's gone on, what have you seen uh, in terms of an evolution of what they're really looking to get out of the program? I think that's in that that'll also kind of give us a bit of an insight to you in terms of thinking, okay, what are how is that part evolving for them? Yeah, so uh, some of the things that we've seen that uh, come more into the core is a little bit some of the stuff I a little bit alluded to slightly earlier product strategy, mm-hmm. which is uh, with the sudden in- influx of new types of users, uh, people who are first time internet users but also directly jumping into like um, you know steep learning curves I mean great Mm -hmm. example is like people at my home like my dad or my mom who would never really pick up their phone and order groceries or anything like that like today our power users of most apps everything is delivered to the door they know how to how to order they know about refunds they know they know everything about uh, and that's that all happened within a period of two or three months right so that's a new type of a user uh, so product strategy for from a founder perspective, from a strategy for the startup perspective, uh, pivots like moving into uh, the and leveraging these new up and coming uh, user uh, flows. I think those areas we've been able to help a lot. And those are some of the requests that startups come to us with, like how do we kind of build for these new users that are coming, new types of users that are coming onto our platform. That also means apps look different. They look simpler. Sometimes mm. there's a lot more localization and, st- and stuff like that. Um, another area that we definitely are AI and machine learning. Right? So they look for a lot more personalization, look for how to provide kind of no-nonsense recommendations that feel like they are really great. So AI ML generally tends to be an area where we're able to help people figure out their uh, model accuracy and you know, the stuff that uh, we really are able to help with machine learning. From a company perspective, uh, I think managing burn rates, um, I think that becomes really critical for startups that are funded. Uh, if you look at the funding uh, kind of data points, where in last year, uh, actually the number of deals that were done in the ecosystem went up. Right? So it was usually, I think the previous year, 2019 was around 
seven hundred odd at deals. But last twenty twenty was when the pandemic year was around eight hundred plus. Uh, but when you look at the overall deal uh, quantity, the size deal sizes were smaller. So which indicates that mm. there are a lot of startups, new startups emerged and they got smaller uh, funds. Um, so how do we make sure that through uncertain times they are able to kind of stretch that uh, that amount and have longer runways? So and even mm. this year we've had startups who well funded uh, but are looking to sustain for a longer period of time, you know, because of the uncertainty that might be around the corner. Um, so we have a lot of mentors who can help optimize their uh, various aspects of the business or even the tech to help save uh, some of that and increase the, reduce the burn rates and Productivity for teams, I think, has been a challenge. And in, in one of the things that is different and unique about something I've seen, hiring was always a challenge with tech uh, talent and mm. building the right teams as startups, finding the right CTO or the setting up the right tech team. I think uh, sometimes it's a challenge in the startup world. But uh, productivity was a challenge in 2022. Um, and right now, I think most startups have figured that out. Um, but as a goal setting for the company to move forward towards one vision, stuff like that, uh, we've been able to help a lot through this program uh, with a model called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, which is used uh, used in the company. And most startups now in our accelerator use the OKR model. Um, and lastly, leadership. I think uh, 65% of startups fail because of uh, some kind of a leadership issue. That's what data says. Yes. Um, and so we've focused a lot on helping founders understand their leadership style. We have some custom surveys we run uh, that we actually share. The surveys are shared between co-founders, investors, employees, um, and the founder or CEO has their own self-assessment to compare a peer mm-hmm. assessment against. It's always an eye-opener and it really it's called the leader's lab. That's been something that we've been able to really share some new learnings and perspectives even for the seasoned entrepreneurs who have mm. who are very self-aware and know that style uh, it's always throws some curve balls at them like they think they're good at x but the team thinks like no yeah. you're pretty crap at that uh, so that's been really <laughs> useful on the people side it's kind of these 360 degree kinds of things uh, that have been new and emerging that we've been able to really add a lot of value to companies on. especially the people part is interesting right because um and, and, and correct me if i'm wrong and and, and i'm almost trying to predict what would have been a trend that you would have seen is that you know initially the focus was a lot more technical in terms of what the mentorship would be around but i'm I'm guessing over the years the people leadership culture i think all those things have should have become a larger part of what uh, you are actually having to work with the startups on Um, i'm guessing here but i'm uh, I'm wondering if that's true very true varun i think i mean we start with what you're good at right Mm, um, yeah. with a, I mean, with a technical team, Google has a strong tech muscles. We can add value there. But when, then when you start talking to startups and say like, hey, I can help you with your machine learning model or mm. I can really add value to you from a product strategy perspective. Uh, but then the founders are like, I got my ML part kind of figured out. Like, yeah. help me hire a co-founder. How do I hire my team? Right. <laughs> so the stuff that keeps entrepreneurs up at night is not isolated to what my strengths are and what mm. I can add value. Yeah. So it was an initiate and iterate approach as it is with everything at Google. And we run things pretty, it's pretty nimble in terms of how we learn and evolve the programs and we constantly look for feedback. That's where today we stand at like a 360 degree program that kind of adds a lot of different, meets entrepreneurs at their points of need. So that's also one of the surprising things that when founders apply to the program, they think oh, that I'm going to get a lot of tech value out mm-hmm. of this, but that's true. And we also are able to kind of address some other needs of, of the company and of the founders uh, that might still be keeping them up at night. So I think that's an evolution that's happened over time. And Today, we are proud to say that we try and touch all of those aspects that really uh, bothers or uh, entrepreneurs care about. So if I'm a startup today and I want to apply uh, for the program, um, what do you what do you look for uh, in, in shortlisting? I mean, what would or in a broad level, what would the criteria be, and 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 what do you really, and and what are the key ones which you really try to find too? So okay, you know they'll be perfect to kind of bring on. Yeah. So over time, we've kind of looked at at what stage can we add the right kind of value. I think the, if we only ask one question to an applicant to ourselves when we look at an applicant, we say, can we add value at the stage that the startup is in at? Um, and today it stands like this: we look at startups that are having really strong traction. Right. Um, and traction means different things depending on the business. Right? It could be a B2B business with 10 clients with huge sizes. 
ticket sizes there or it could be like a b2c company with a million downloads which could be which we could consider as really strong uh, but we we look at uh, you know multiple uh, indicators rather than just focus on one or two cut off kind of indicators so we look at traction we definitely look at the team um, how well the founding team is composed do they have a dedicated team on tech on design uh, and how balanced the team looks the reason is we get a lot of volunteer mentors right so varun if you are a mentor at gfsa mm. and you are dedicating say maybe 2 hours a month to talk to a startup we want to make sure that your time is valuable and that mm. whatever advice you're giving is meant to, the startup is able to actually act on it and come back so we want the startups to have that ability and the team to actually listen to feedback and kind of implement that into production um or be smart enough to consider that as a group and say no this works or no this doesn't work so we look at the team and their ability to turn on feedback um we look at uh, funding it's more of an indicator um if the startup has raised seed at least raised seed funding is what we ask for uh, and the reason is it's mostly a gating criteria right now otherwise you end up getting like you know india has got like i think 112000 startups in all 7000 yeah. added in 2020 more so in this year we got a lot of applicants so we look at yeah. funding as one indicator uh, for us to say that look they are making some progress we need the startup to at least have an mvp with uh, with a, I mean, when i say traction we're assuming we have an mvp but uh, with some use of real use of feedback i think that's very very important we want the app to be in use and real users providing feedback and the startup is making some iterations um and we are a stage agnostic program so it's not necessary that you should be at a uh, series a or a particular stage we say if anywhere from c to series a you may even have series b company and that's reflective of the fact that we do customized mentoring for every startup right and so it's not a curriculum based program where everyone passes through one end and out the other everyone has a unique and different journey so yeah like good traction great teams um, we look for uh, startups who have uh, at least seed funding um, and in terms of the verticals uh, we look at we, we are again not necessarily sector specific mm-hmm. but like i mentioned uh, you know there are some emerging trends and needs in the economy uh, that we'd love to support startups solving for that uh, fintech healthcare edtech uh media and entertainment gaming too uh, i think we want to agri tech sustainability these areas startups are solving for uh, and we care a lot of the, about these areas so uh, we try and look at what sectors the startups are coming from uh, as well um so broadly these are the high level criteria we we require them to be based in india of course um and uh, we're really curious of the way they are solving these problems so if they are using ai machine learning or really cutting edge and interesting approaches we believe we have the mentors uh, that can really talk to that and help them enhance that even further uh, and accelerate the, that uh, product part and tech part of it so those are the list of things we look for for i have a bunch more questions but i know we need to go for a break so i'm going to quickly do that and be right back with advertising instead I've been keeping track of what Intel's been doing and they've impressed me yet again. You heard about Intel V Pro, huh? Yeah, um, you know, for security and manageability, there's nothing quite like Intel V Pro. It helps manage and protect your organization's computer systems from cyber attacks and keeps them functioning at their best capacity. It's something I found in my experience as well, right? Cybersecurity is something that you can't take lightly. Like whether it's personal or professional, we're definitely doubling down on this. It's a must. Absolutely. You know, with Intel's threat detection technology, which is built into the Intel hardware shield, Your company's IT department can quickly detect and remediate the latest ransomware and crypto mining attacks. And there's also all of their below the OS security, right, which helps identify unauthorized changes to hardware and firmware. And then they have application and data protection which helps prevent memory corruption and malware injection by isolating different machines on your organization's network, which in the end basically reduces attack surfaces. You know, it's good to see that Intel has a platform that's built for business. Yeah, it really is. I mean, like you know, the Intel V Pro platform also enables cloud-based manageability. So in the event of a cyber attack, it lets you remotely manage and repair systems simultaneously even if they're not at the same location. You know, this is a godsend for these work from home times especially. Amen to that. Just go check out Intel V Pro and Intel's other amazing products at intel.in/itheroes. Intel V Pro, it's built for business. Welcome back to Advertising is Dead. We're still talking to Paul. Um, I want to kind of go from what you were talking about before the break and kind of get your perspective on broadly what you're seeing and and, and as you see uh, with your journey with startups across the accelerator over the last many years. What are you seeing as trends going ahead? What are you seeing 
things evolve towards um especially in this space in, both in terms of what startups are really going to look for i know some of them you alluded to in the uh, previously um, but more in terms of what you feel they're going to look at what they will need and and, and the role that you know companies like google are going to play in that kind of getting amplified sure yeah great question I, i i do believe that if you just look at this year as an example varun like i think we added like 20 plus unicorns mm. in like such a short mm. period of time never before it's happened um even the the trends we are seeing on the deals and the gene sizes all of that indicates to me that uh, there is a mature i mean india is already mature in some sense in terms of the startup ecosystem but the further maturing consolidation that's happening in the ecosystem yeah. um and entrepreneurs in india are like uh, and and i work uh, and my team is spread across the globe right so india stands out when it comes to the maturity of the entrepreneurs or mm. uh, how self aware they are about solving for these problems uh they even fail fast unlike mm. many other uh, you know other areas that i have seen so i think um the today i think in india we have more than 500 plus accelerator incubators yes. majority of them are in the academia space right uh, mm. about i would say 50 60 of those are in the corporate accelerator those kind of investor kind of spaces uh, so i think there is a maturing and therefore the programs uh, i think need to evolve and move towards uh offering a lot more um you know firepower when it comes to supporting entrepreneurs like mm. so from corporates uh, like google i think how oh, this program is a great example of what we are able to do right rally the ecosystem around what startups are solving for and help them grow uh, mm. and at the same time whatever we have on offer we kind of put it on the table as well uh, so i think this maturing requires a certain move towards say uh companies like google to kind of lean into it offer more uh areas of thought leadership uh, put out stuff there that can guide and help and help entrepreneurs understand how to solve for these things uh and that means an evolution of programs like google for startups uh to help companies in a much stronger way in a deeper way i would say uh the other area that i really care about as we go forward is definitely on women entrepreneurship i think mm. that's a trend that you know i'm personally following me observing it's kind of a passion project of mine as well um mm. and there if you look at data you know it it's pretty abysmal in terms of funding right yeah. Uh, yeah. in terms of women founders i think data says about 5 or 6% of women of all deals uh, that were done in 2018 through 20 were uh, had a women uh, co-founder and if you look at just solo women founders yeah. it's like less than 2% so that's terrible um, yeah. and that's and that in that two year period So that's something that's interesting uh, an area where i believe there is an opportunity uh, for us to kind of lean in and offer some of the google uh, work that we've been doing and extend that more closely when we've already been doing pretty well in in terms of our accelerator itself we always ensure we have like uh, at least 30 40% uh, you know women founders co-founders uh, tend to have uh, you know representation in our cohorts organically uh, we it's it's not that it happened on its own right uh, when i look back in 2015 16 when we first put out our first accelerator we had less than 8% women applicants mm. um and then we followed that up with a little bit more targeted outreach and today i think almost 20 25% of our applicant pool tends to have uh, you know women founders co founders in there. but generally in the ecosystem i think this is a challenge and uh, women entrepreneurs some research has also highlighted the areas where you know they look for support and help uh, and that that tends to be at least in our applicant pool what we've noticed in terms of talking to people who almost applied uh, and on why did not why did you not apply the last time right mm. uh, they always believe they are not ready uh, or yeah. they work for they wait for a, a more perfect timing um, and they have a slightly higher kind of personal goal to achieve before they believe they can ask for help and these are mm. just from people we have spoken with uh, whereas if most entrepreneurs who are male they just tend to apply you know like yeah uh, and hope that you know they get selected and they're a little bit yeah. more bullish on that one so there are yeah. few things like that that hopefully we can address uh, you know with some of our efforts you make a very interesting point right is that one is obviously the environment and how it's obviously we're trying to on one and make it a more inclusive startup ecosystem with having a better ratio of founders but just that part about how women founders have looked at it versus how male founders have looked at it, it is an interesting one to pick up saying you know, some but just the mindset difference there and then to really be able to 
come on to your side and say, okay, one second, how do I make sure that I balance it out knowing that the mindsets are, are different in that uh, on, on a more generalized basis? So, so are there any specific steps you guys are kind of trying to take to kind of move towards equaling that out or um, especially in, in the gender uh, balance? Yeah, like, um, I mean, the thing that obviously you can't do is you have a certain bar for accelerating a company. Exactly. Yeah. In terms of how to add value, they, they need to be at a certain stage to be able to benefit from a program like this. But if you go back in the funnel uh, and look at the applicant pool, like if you have just 8% folks applying, mm. uh, there's a problem right there. And we try and address it at that stage where we do a lot more targeted evangelism or go to uh, efforts that exist in the ecosystem. And there's a lot of efforts like that and kind of uh, invite folks to consider programs like this uh, for uh, helping the startups to move forward. Right. So I think just increasing the base of the applicant pool is one way to do it. Another way that uh, that we did it uh, was apart from our accelerator program, we started something called boot camps. Um, mm. You know, like uh, these were three or four day short format speed dating style accelerator in a week in a box kind of efforts that we did only for women founders uh, across uh, across the ecosystem. So these were called launchpad boot camps. Uh, I think that helped a lot for people to one know at what stage I need to be to benefit from an accelerator uh, and what what is an accelerator, uh, how can it help me. And I think that awareness actually helps uh, founders. And we can also talk to founders that are a little bit earlier in the pipeline. Yeah. Some folks say like, look, I just have an idea on early, early traction. I'm not eligible to apply. But they might be in six months. I think talking to them a little earlier helped a lot. So I yeah. think those are some of the efforts we did to, uh, to proactively kind of reach out uh, and get more and more folks to apply to the program so they can be considered. And eventually it leads to more folks being represented in a full, full-blown accelerator. I want to just take a bit of a, a segue here and ask you, how did you, how did your career trajectory lead you to um, being a part of the accelerator? I, I think I, I always find it interesting that there are two sides of this, right? Is one is that um, one is to actually, one is the founder side, but the other side is if, if you are giving them that to sound corny enough to helping them accelerate in that sense, how has your journey kind of led you to this? Um, what did you set out wanting to do and how did you end up here? Or, or, or rather, did you, did you want to end up here is the question. <laughs> a great question. So. I mean, as a personal career journey, right? So, um, I mean, I just completed 16 years at Google mm. uh, just just last week, and uh, I started I started at this company working mostly on uh, you know on the Google search uh, initiative uh, with uh, trust and safety, which is about ensuring quality on the search engine. It was a little bit of a different type of a role. A mm. uh, few years down the line, uh, I had the opportunity to switch uh, and internally move to uh, emerging markets kind of an effort. From there, I moved to, uh, you know, the developer initiatives that I just uh, talked, spoke to you about earlier. Yeah. Mostly focused directly working the developer community, student developers, uh, professional developers, and so on. And then now startups, right? So for me, it's been about trying things that keep me excited. Mm. And the way I see myself is through all of these different roles, uh, the closest that I've been to feel impact. Mm. Closest that I've been in my career to feel something I did had a meaningful impact on someone's life directly. Of course, being part of Google, you know, you, you do feel like you're making a difference, but nothing like selecting a company, in the accelerator that's made a massive difference to people's lives, right? Uh, and like I can think of so many companies with more than 90 graduates now. Uh, yeah. ShareChat is a great example. Nest Away or DriveZ, companies you might have heard of. Baby yeah. Chakra have all made. So that kind of feeling of impact. Uh, was is very strong now. And so I see myself uh, as an enabler more than anything else. Mm. I might not make a great entrepreneur for sure, right? Uh, but I am. I'm. I've found uh, a space here that allows me to uh, enable entrepreneurs through through the platform that Google offers here uh, through the partner and accelerator program here. That's how my quick like two minute version of <laughs> my journey has been. And uh, yeah, like working with startups high energy, always energizing experience. And I've, yeah. I've loved it so far. Yeah. What have you kind of learned uh, individually in terms of what it, like some of them you just, you just brought out in your in your last answer, right? But what have you learned is really required to be part of an accelerator. Like how can you give the most value, um, especially when you're working with startups, especially when you're working with founders? Uh, what have you learned over time? Say, okay, you know, this is what not just you, but your team really needs to imbibe. And you know, what are the core things that make someone really good at as being a part of an accelerator? I mean, it's a great question and it's an evolution and a learning for me too, right? So I think the number one thing to realize is founders are smart people. Founders can smell uh, 
uh, when you have a program that's there just for the sake of it. And mm-hmm. founders can mm-hmm. smell value when value is there to be had. Yeah. Uh, I think the first thing is to be honest about what you can offer as a program. And I think create an environment where founders really open up and ask you for real help. And we create an environment where, you know, from day one, even when we are trying to select startups, we say no pitching. You're not, mm. we're not, you're not here to sell me your company, but we are here to work together on how to make your journey better. So I think creating that kind of psychological safety for founders to feel like, look, I'm getting the real value here in this relationship or this program. And that uh, Google really cares about uh, the journey that I'm having as a startup. Right? So uh, I think that's number one, right? understanding. And, and that kind of talks to some of the values of the company, which is focus on the user and understanding, doing the right thing for the user. And in this particular case, you can say it's a, it's a startup founder. The second thing is, uh, which we alluded to earlier, is like learning off of feedback. Right. It's always mm. an evolution. Right. If I look back at how this program was three years ago, it was very different than what it is now. And I think alumni and others contribute their thoughts to how we could improve things and we always take the best bits and keep adding it back into the ecosystem. The third thing is uh, recognizing that, look, the ecosystem is constantly evolving. It's not the same. And uh, so adding things to the program uh, that can actually uh, add value, making changes and pivots ourselves to lean into new opportunities or new areas where the ecosystem needs us. I think this is super important. And uh, I mean, I want to take a moment to also give a shout out that, look, this is all based on so many volunteer mentors in the ecosystem. Mm. And I think it's just really the collective wisdom of crowd that we're able to kind of fine tune and offer to startups in a strong way. 30 plus Google teams, of course, but more than 100 mentors from the ecosystem also engage. Uh, so all of their collective inputs helps us to keep it fresh and keep it on point for when startups uh, and uh, you know where the ecosystem is evolving as well. And moment to say that like formats, curriculum, and how the, those elements of the program design uh, I think they become extremely important without dwelling too, too much on details. I think it's also important for incubators or accelerators to really have great teams. Um, and and Varun, I want to just take a quick segue to say that we Google for Startups actually has a partner program mm-hmm. um, where with Accelerator, we get into an in-depth mentoring for about mm-hmm. 40 to 60 companies a year, right? But yeah. India has got so many thousands of startups coming. So we actually work with partners in the ecosystem and we have very few of them whom we work closely with Mm. to uh, kind of put out some of the content, the mentor and just provide access to some of this goodness uh, to startups out there. And uh, we have Social Alpha, 91 Springboard, Deshpande Foundation Mm. uh, and T-Hub. So these these are all different partners we currently work with. It's growing list. But it's our attempt to offer some of this goodness at scale to the ecosystem. And the reason I talk about that uh, in the context of this question is it takes great teams to understand mm-hmm. the needs of the ecosystem and to run programs that stay fresh and uh, are seen as valuable by entrepreneurs. So I think we work or try to find partners who kind of mirror some of those values and uh, uh, slowly but surely we're trying to push out more of this goodness more than just 40 or 80 companies a year. That point about partners is so important right? as you can try to scale out a program it's not just about what you're doing but not, not just what it's even even external mentors come in and do but really about how can you build a network so the, the entire ecosystem gets more value out of it. I think that's, that's a very uh, important uh, point there. You know towards the end of every episode I ask my guests um, a set of questions. Those questions have been constant. Um, they have nothing to do with what we've spoken about so far. Um, they're <laughs> mostly random. Um, uh, so the, the first one is that um, what I spend a lot of time doing that uh, most people would be surprised to know that apart from your day job, you, you actually spend a lot of time doing this as well. I, I'm just going to put this in there that I do know that you played in a in a band when you were in engineering college, as we realized before we hit record <laughs> on this podcast. Um, I don't know if that's something which you which you do in your in your free time, but I, I, I love to know what you spend a lot of time doing beyond work. Sure. Yeah. Well, right now I'm father to a pandemic baby. <laughs> yeah. So she she keeps me up. Uh, yeah, my daughter is six months old. Uh, but okay. yeah, music has been a big part of uh, you know my life, and uh, I think probably peaked right when I was in college uh, with my interest to kind of uh, join a band and we put something together. And uh, fun fact was I played my first gig, so to speak, at Varun's college. Passive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. It was a forgettable experience. So quick story there, right? The band that played before us played like some kind of a heavy uh, hard rock and heavy metal song mm. and 
and the entire crowd went crazy people were yeah. doing that and then it was our turn to come up and we were playing wonderful tonight by eric clapton <laughs> That that that, so that, is, a, that is a playlist <laughs> transition that everybody would would be like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the just uh, the lots fell uh, in that that way, the order wise. But then, uh, yeah, we managed to finish, uh, and we just kind of walked off the stage, and we almost got booed off, to be honest. But oh, yeah, no. but uh, it we I mean uh, the band and all of that never took off, but uh, music has been a constant part of uh, you know this. Uh, keeping me in my in the right head space um anything that you've uh, read watched or listened to recently that you would recommend um i've been reading a lot of reports <laughs> to be honest <laughs> on startups and stuff uh, but besides that like uh, i mean an important part of my personal life is my faith and mm. uh, you know i have a small church community and we kind nice. of uh, meet up regularly and uh, do a lot of activities in the in the area where i live so that keeps me going um, and uh, really connected uh, and just kind of keeps me balanced so uh, i'm not a voracious reader so to mm. speak but yeah I, i do stay in touch with a lot of the technical blogs and other stuff that's happening because uh, i'm in this space but yeah um, that's what i've been doing um what can you put together in an instant i can change a diaper <laughs> in a expected, minute <laughs> expected from a father of 6 years 6 months i have a 4 year old so i totally relate uh, fathers of daughters unite is what i like to call it but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah um and and my last question which is generally uh, a lift off of the pod, name of the podcast itself is um, i'm trying to figure what um, and this is generally where I, it's more pressure on me because i'm trying to figure out uh, how to word this one is um, why do you think this the the growth of the startup space the way it has uh, will not die Uh, a lot of it has to do with the recent changes um uh, but also the emergence of i would say the gig economy mm. and so many folks who are were not say quote and quote employable about two years ago uh, have new lines of jobs and opportunities available so it's really interesting to see how that whole thing is going to evolve i think there's a fundamental shift in the way consumption is happening and that opens up opportunities for so many people in in an ecosystem like india so that i'm hopeful of thanks so much paul thanks for coming on the podcast um and thanks for coming on and 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 hey talking about what you guys are doing but also kind of giving us a broad view on on the entire space itself um thanks for coming on advertising is day thanks for enjoyed the conversation thanks for having me If you like this podcast and you want to listen to more podcasts like this, head over to the IBM Podcast website or app or wherever you get your podcasts from and look at all the podcasts that IBM makes. There's some really fun stuff there. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On this very special 150th episode of Advertising is Dead, Varun's in conversation with Pooja Tengra, pastry chef, podcaster and founder of Love 15 Patisserie. Do check out this episode for a look at her journey as a creator and entrepreneur. On Pesa Vesa Anupam is joined by Ravi Ravula Parthi, CEO and co-founder of Kapita Fintech. They discuss the problems when it comes to e-shops i.e. employee stock options. Facebook announced their rebranding and its ambitions on becoming a metaverse company on Simplify. Tony Chuck and the others talk about what this means. On All Things Policy, Ruturaj Gowaikar and Aditya Parikh discuss the European Union's Arctic strategy. And on Say No to Drama, tune in to episode Moodiness, My Birthright. As Chitna talks about how you can be as moody as you want to be. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And do follow us on YouTube. We have a number of different channels. You can find them on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, where you'll be able to take a look at all of the channels we have. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, Slay Coffee, Intel, and Oxfam India. Thank you so much. You make this possible. सफर रास्ते मंजिल और मुकाम अक्सर ये हमसे कुछ कहना चाहते हैं पर हम हैं कि अपनी रोजमर्रा की जिंदगी में इन्हें सुनने से कतराते हैं नमस्ते दोस्तों मेरा नाम है केशव चतुर्वेदी और मैं आपको ले चलूंगा कुछ ऐसे सफर पर जहां आपको एक नया नजरिया मिलेगा सफर और मंजिलों को देखने का आइए इन किस्से कहानियों में डूब जाए हर मंगलवार और शुक्रवार 